with us in this moment. Amen. Amen. God is so good, hey? And his presence is here with us, and he wants to meet with us. Let's pray before we uh, get started. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are here, that you love us, Lord, and that you are that firm foundation like no one else, like nothing else, God. And we lean into you, you, your voice, your word tonight, God. And we pray that you would bless our time together in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, you can grab your seats. How are we doing? Are you kind of confused by the weather? Sun, rain, sun, thunderstorm, sun again. So good to be here with you. I love our church. I love our church. I love being part of our church. We have amazing uh, senior pastors, Pastor Damon and Julie. How many of you love them? I know they're away right now, uh, enjoying some time away with family, but I definitely miss them, and I'm very thankful for them, and I'm always really humbled and uh, grateful for the opportunity to, to speak at our church and hopefully bring something that's going to help someone in this room. That's just my prayer. When I put together a sermon, I'm like, I just hope it helps somebody. I hope someone goes away just thinking, yeah, I got something from that, and it, and it helps me in my, my walk of faith. And, you know, we've been in a wisdom series looking at different aspects of wisdom with God. And we had Pastor Onagre start us off, and he was talking about how do we understand the wisdom literature? When we look at the Bible, how do we read it? And then last week we had Pastor John, and he was talking about godly discernment. How do we know when something is wise? How do we know when something is not wise? And today we're going to continue to dive into Scripture and look more at what it means to pursue godly wisdom. And I'm going to start us off with a story. This story takes place in my life in 2008. I'm on a missions trip uh, with a church that I was a part of at the time. And we were in Indonesia. Anybody from Indonesia in here? Yeah? That's beautiful. I love Indonesia. It was so beautiful there. I was in a place called Bali. It was gorgeous. And uh, we were doing missions work there, but there was one particular morning where we could go out and go to a beach called Kuda Beach, and we could just go and enjoy the beach and, and be there. And, and we, were, we were warned that the waves were very powerful on this particular day, and my friend Miranda and I were like, okay, we'll be careful. We'll stay close to the shore. We we're going to go out boogie boarding. I'd never done that before in my life. So, of course, things are going to go well. I think you can know where the story's going. Uh, anyway, we go out into the ocean, and we're having a great time. And we're boogie boarding, or I'm pretending to boogie board because I don't really know how. And we come back into shore, and everything's great. And we're like, that was lots of fun. We should go out and do that again. But this time, the waves are getting more and more powerful. And again, people are telling us, you got to be careful, like you can go out, but this is a beach that swim at your own risk, okay? So there's no lifeguards, you're on your own. Like if you go out there and you get into trouble, you're in trouble. So we're like, we're, we're going to be okay, we're going to be safe, and we, we go out and we're having lots of fun, and then I'm looking for my friend Miranda, and I don't know where she is. I have no idea where she's gotten to. And I remember I'm out there, I'm enjoying being out in the waves, and I look behind, and the shoreline is so far away. Have you ever been pulled out by the tide? And you look back, and you're like, how did I get so far? Like, how am I this far out? And I remember just this sinking feeling of hopelessness. Like, I, there is no way in my own strength I'm going to be able to get back to the shore. And so I remember just think, feeling so hopeless, and then I hear the sound of a huge wave coming right for me, behind me. And I look, and sure enough, huge. It was two waves that merged into one big wave, and it took me under, and I got caught in the undertow. And if you've ever been caught in the undertow, it feels like you're in a washing machine, like your body's being twisted and turned all in the water, and you don't know which way's up. Like, you can't figure it out when you're caught in the undertow. So I'm there, and I remember twisting around and around in the water, not knowing which way was up. And I remember praying to God, like, God, I don't want to die this way. This is not how I envisioned my death. Dying at Kuta Beach in Indonesia on a missions trip because I don't know how to boogie board, and I'm out in the ocean, I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, 
I resurface. I didn't know if I would, but I resurfaced, and I just lost my pride in that moment. I, I start like waving. I'm like, I need help. Somebody help me. And there was a surfer who was out there, and he came over. He saw me. He came over, and he tried to help me, and so he held me by the wrist, but he went under with me a few times. He tried to get me on his board, and it just nothing was working. He was starting to go under with me. But then a crazy, crazy miracle happened. So remember how this is swim at your own risk? Well, a lifeguard came out and rescued me, put me on his board, and within seconds, I'm there at the shore. Now, why did that happen at a swim at your own risk beach? Well, this is where the story gets kind of weird. Because as I approach the beach, there's a video camera on me. No jokes. They're filming for a lifeguard rescue program. <laughs> Not even joking. <laughs> So I see my friend Miranda, she's also rescued by a lifeguard, and I'm being rescued by a lifeguard, and there's a video camera taking in this whole moment, and I'm dazed and confused, like I almost just died, I'm like in a foreign country, I come up out of the water, and there's this lady with an Australian accent talking to me, and asking if I'm okay to be on a show called Bondi Rescue. <laughs> I don't know, has anyone seen that show? Do you know that show? Okay, I hadn't heard of it before. So anyway, she's interviewing me, because I'm just like, sure, like I'm consenting to everything, because like my mind, I don't even know where, like what's happening. And uh, she's interviewing me and Miranda, and the one thing I remember saying is just like, we don't have waves like this in Lake Ontario. <laughs> and I'm like, I just didn't know where I was. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is scary. Anyway, I kid you not, I don't know, somewhere, in the world, and someone found it for me once. There is a clip of me and my friend Miranda on Bondi Rescue, Kuda Beach, 2008 season. I don't know, if you find it, send it my way. I just put, I don't wanna see it, it's fine. It was somewhere on YouTube floating around, and I'm like, oh gosh. But yeah, I ended up on a lifeguard saving program. Anyway, why am I telling you this very crazy, bizarre story from my life and my 15 seconds of, of fame? Um, you know what, this event, gave me a deep respect for the ocean and a reverence for the immense power of the waves. Like, it's good to have a healthy fear of the ocean, a healthy reverence for the incredible power of water in motion. And if you don't, you are a fool who will end up on a show like me, a TV program, right? Well, just as I had to learn to have respect and a reverential attitude toward the ocean in order to save my life and avoid death. The Bible tells us we are to have a respect and reverential attitude toward God. In fact, the first moment we posture our hearts in reverence to God and respect Him is the point at which wisdom begins. That's where wisdom starts. Take a look at this scripture. They're going to put it on the screen. Proverbs 9.10 it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, wisdom doesn't begin when we go to school. Wisdom doesn't begin when you follow a trendy influencer on social media, okay? Wisdom doesn't begin once you obtain a PhD and have all your degrees on your wall and have read through all the books this world has to offer. Wisdom doesn't begin when you're old and gray, okay? Wisdom begins at the moment a person comes to realize who God is and who they are in relation to God. It's when a person says, God is God, and I'm not. He is the king of the universe. I am not. He is all-powerful. I am not. Wisdom begins when we make a choice to bow down in holy reverence before God's throne of grace and we choose to fear the Lord. Now, I want to stop on that word. I want to stop on the word fear because we need to think about that a little bit if we're going to understand what this means. Because you may hear that and it sparks thoughts about being afraid or scared of something or someone, right? Like a fear of the dark, a fear of spiders, a fear of heights, I just found out, apparently, now there is a fear called nomophobia. Has anyone heard of that? It's basically a fear of being without your mobile phone. <laughs> like not having enough battery life or not having your phone with you. Any nomophobic people in the room? Like I think I have that phobia. Like I need my mobile phone if I don't have it. 
But the phrase, okay, fear God, isn't meaning being afraid or scared of God. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean we are to have an anxious, paralyzing reaction where we try to hide away from him because he's the boogeyman under the bed, right? That's, that's not what the word fear means here. The word fear in this context can be understood as a reverence for God, okay? A respect for his power and his authority. And it's a recognition that we are sinners in the presence of a perfect and holy God. So we begin to be wise and to obtain true wisdom for life when we acknowledge who God is and we come under his authority, right? In fact, I want you to think about this. I want you to consider this. Uh, Picture a man or a woman living in poverty, okay, never been well-educated or had the opportunity to go to school or learn how to read. I want you to imagine that. And then I want you to put that against someone who's the most prestigious academic in the world, with lots of degrees on their wall. How could it be possible that the person living in poverty who can't even read could be wiser than the person who has all the prestigious degrees? How could that be possible? Well, it's possible because consider this, wisdom is not lots of head knowledge, right? It's not knowing a lot of things about a lot of things. We need to make a distinction between knowledge and wisdom. They're different. Okay, as the British journalist Miles Kingston once said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. (laughs) Now, some of you might put tomato with your pineapple. I don't know, maybe you're that kind of person. I don't think I would. In the words of the late preacher Charles Spurgeon, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. He says, many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Wisdom begins at the point of revering God and following his word. Then we acquire principles for living a godly life and apply them so that we can walk on a path of wisdom. So today, church, we are going to unpack what it means to fear the Lord and how we can apply this to our lives and our walk of faith. And we're going to look at three convictions or beliefs that flow out of a heart that fears the Lord. And so if you're looking for a title for this message, it's simply this, Where Wisdom Begins. We're going to look at that, Where Wisdom Begins. And the first conviction or belief that we're going to look at that you would find within the heart of a wise person is this, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the first conviction you're going to find. Now, the truth is, we are all created to worship, right? It's how we're designed as humans. And if you don't worship Jesus, you will worship someone or something else because it's in our design, right? Worship is really just placing your heart in a position to be devoted. You are giving your time, your focus, your adoration to someone or something. So if it's not Jesus, it could be you bow down to a God of another religion You worship your career. Maybe you idolize a celebrity. Maybe you devote your heart to acquire lots of money or material possessions. Maybe you follow ideologies of thinkers and philosophers of this age. Maybe you pour all your love and adoration into a romantic relationship. Or maybe you even worship yourself and you're consumed with vanity. And you know, it's absolutely unpopular and offensive to many people to say that there is only one true God. It's offensive, right? We're living in a time where people feel much more comfortable saying, if it's true for you, then it's true. Live your truth, right? I think back to Pastor John's sermon from last week where we're trying to discern between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. Godly wisdom would say, there is one true God. Worldly wisdom would say, whatever's true for you is true. But I want you to consider that for a moment, right? Because it's, it might, to say, you know, you can have your truth, it might feel good in the moment because it kind of makes you feel like, oh, that's a bit more comfortable to say that. But it's actually logically unsound. I mean, consider this. Just humor me for a moment. If I said that this, it's true that this is an iPad, but it's equally true this is a piece of celery, you would look at me like I'd totally lost grip on reality. You'd be like, that is not a piece of celery, that's an iPad, right? But if I said, well, that's true for me, that it's a piece of celery, 
say, well, you're not seeing truth in a real way, are you? And so think about that in relation to faith. I want you to think about this. Some people in the world would say, there is no God. Some people in the world would say, there is a God. Well, it cannot be simultaneously true that there is no God. Well, at the same time, true that there is a God. Those two things cannot be true at the same time. You know, some people would say, you have one life. You just have one life to live. Some people believe you have many lives and you keep being reincarnated and coming back to earth in different forms. Well, it can't be true that you have one life and also true that you have many lives, right? Those two things cannot be true at the same time. And in scripture, Jesus is very clear. He's very, very clear that he is the way, the truth, the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. He gave very clear directions. He said, I'm the way, right? That through him, we head back home to God. So it cannot be true if we say that Jesus is the one true God, the Lord, the master ruler of the universe, while at the same time saying, well, there's many gods, there's many ways, there's many paths. Those things cannot be true simultaneously. You see what I'm saying? And for some of you in this room, that might be really, really uncomfortable, and you don't want to even believe it, but I pray that you keep your heart open and receptive, because the Bible promises this, that truth will set you free, and when you know the truth, when you find true freedom, not a freedom the world promises, the world does promise a freedom, but it's not true freedom. But the freedom that Christ promises through his truth, through his word, will truly, will truly set you free. Does anyone love Timothy Keller or Tim Keller? Like his preaching, his books. I'm just, I don't know, I'm in a season where I'm just kind of reading his books and listening to his sermons and I'm just really um, soaking in what he's, what he's shared about the word. And this is, um, I'm reading from a book right now called Counterfeit Gods. It's a really good read. And this is one of the quotes in his book. He says, the only way to free ourselves from the destructive influence of counterfeit gods is to turn back to the true one. The living God who revealed himself both at Mount Sinai on the cross is the only Lord who, if you find him, can truly fulfill you. And if you fail him, can truly forgive you. So wisdom begins at the point where we decide to worship the one true God as revealed through Jesus Christ. And there are many things, there are many things on offer in the marketplace of religion, philosophy, ideology. And many people like to take bits and pieces of different things that sound or feel good. But true wisdom begins when we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And listen, not just a good teacher who helped us know how to make good choices, right? Not just a kind person who walked on earth and helped people, but Lord, creator, right? God. And if he's not Lord in your life and your heart, in your heart, then you will not come with reverence to his word for direction or wisdom. You will continue worshiping other things and try to find fulfillment and satisfaction for your soul elsewhere. So it's important that if we want to be people who are wise, that we live in reverence to God, that we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, as we're instructed to do in the book of Romans. Scripture is clear that whether or not we acknowledge him as Lord, one day, everybody's gonna, everybody's going to. Listen to this in Philippians 2, 9 to 11. It says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. A heart that fears God will make that choice now to make him Lord. They will bow down in reverence and acknowledge the sovereign power and deity of Jesus Christ. So that's the first conviction. The first conviction, if you're taking notes, is Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the second conviction that's going to flow out of a wise heart. It's this. You will hear someone say, I am a sinner in need of forgiveness. That's the second conviction that I want to talk about tonight. Now, I'm going to be honest. When I first came to the Lord around the age of 18, I didn't come because I recognized I was a sinner in need of forgiveness. I didn't. I came to him because I was really anxious and I was looking for peace. That's why I initially came to him. And amazingly, I reached out to God. I said, God, if you're real, show me. And he did. He revealed himself through Jesus Christ to me. 
But also he filled me with peace and deep purpose and I got placed in an amazing church community, so supportive. But you know, over the course of time, the Lord has been showing more and more my own sinfulness and my desperate need for his grace and forgiveness. Because you know what, growing up, I'll be honest, I was the kid in school, I was the kid who followed the rules. I was that kid. I'm a teacher now, so I just, I, I just tell the rules now, get people to obey me, but I was. I liked following the rules. I did my homework. I got pretty good grades. Tell me the boundaries, I'll stay within it. That was me. How many of you were rule followers? Yeah, yeah, let's stick together. Um, who, were, <laughs> who were the rebels? Be honest, who were the rebellious? Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Who were the fence sitters? Like some people are like, hmm, like I could go either way depending on how much anarchy is occurring in a classroom. Yeah, like you could be, you could be tempted to rebel. Yeah, well, I was definitely, I was definitely a rule follower, I was. But you know what, my self-perception of being a good kid actually puffed me up with pride to not even see my sin. The Bible says, though, in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God, each person. No one is righteous apart from Jesus. He is the only one who lived a sinless life. I want you to think about this scripture in, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. It says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim, listen, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Woo! So, in my own life, the Lord has had to do a work to show me my sin and how much I need to be reconciled with him and ask for his forgiveness. Now, I shared the story about me almost dying in Indonesia and going on a lifeguard rescue program. I have a second unflattering story about my life that I thought I would share with you. And a uh, very simple story. There's no drama. It wasn't recorded for television. But it was over at 888 Young when we had church over there. And I was in the bathroom on the, the second floor just outside the, outside the green room where we normally met to pray. The creative team would meet and pray before service started. And there's a bathroom on the second floor that has a window. Okay, And in, in this particular day, there was a lot of sun shining in through that window. And as the sun was shining in through the window and I looked at my reflection, I had this thought. Man, my teeth are yellow. Man, my teeth are yellow. Have they always been that yellow? Are they that stained? Like, I thought I had nice white teeth until the pure sunlight flowing in through the bathroom window shone and revealed the stains from tea and coffee over the years. And I had a flashback to that commercial. Do you remember that commercial? I don't know if it was for toothpaste or tooth whitening or something, but there's like two girls sitting on a couch and they're like, you should do the Kleenex test. And then they hold up the tissue and they're like, if your teeth aren't as white as this tissue, there's something horribly wrong with you. And I'm like, whose teeth are as white as a bleached, bleached piece of tissue? I don't know, mine aren't. Anyway, so I looked at myself in the mirror, just being totally honest, please don't come afterwards and analyze my teeth. I'm, I'm not gonna smile at anyone after church. I'll just be like, mm, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> I cover my mouth. Anyway, in that moment in the bathroom, I thought, like, I'm never going to drink tea or coffee again. Like, this stuff's staining my teeth. And, I, of course, I still drink tea and coffee. It, I didn't change that. But this is the, why am I telling you this? Like, why am I telling you about my yellow teeth? There's got to be a point, and I, I, hope, I hope this actually makes sense and that I didn't just tell a really embarrassing story about myself. But I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Come, imagine me, I'm in the bathroom, I see my teeth, I'm like, man, those are yellow. The sunlight's pouring in, revealing the stains on my teeth, and the Holy Spirit even used that moment to speak to me. And I felt like he said, that's what your sin is like. Against the backdrop of culture, you may feel or seem like you're good, but in the light of my holiness you can see just how stained and sinful you are. And you know, it takes humility to recognize our sin and humble ourselves before God and see we need his forgiveness. When we deny that we sin or we don't think we need God's forgiveness, we really are fooling ourselves. I want you to think about this. And in Psalm 36, one to two, it says this. 
I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. We live in a world where people are blinded by their own sin. Like if you ask someone on the street, are you a good person? They'll probably say, like, yeah, I'm a good person. I try, I try to live a moral life. You know, I, I'm no Mother Teresa, but I'm not an ax murderer. You know, I'm somewhere in between. I'm, I'm, trying to do, I'm trying to do good in the world. But Jesus said, no one is truly good except God alone. God is the standard for goodness. And guys, he's perfect. So like, what hope is there for us? How can we be good people? Well, here's the truth. We can't on our own. We need God's forgiveness. Jesus died and paid the penalty for our sin in exchange for his righteousness. We could never do enough good things to be good. We are only good when we're washed clean by Jesus. You know, if you want a, a good example of scripture of two people who demonstrated completely opposite heart postures towards God, I want us to um, think about the two criminals on the cross next to Jesus. We're going to read this part of scripture together. It's found in Luke 23, starting in verse uh, 32. It says, two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd washed and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really, if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. And the soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, huh, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. He hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, I assure you. Today you will be with me in paradise. I want you to think about that. One criminal who mocks Jesus and has no reference for God, no reverence, and the other one who believes Jesus is the Messiah. I love how the one criminal says, don't you fear God? Like here you are at the point of death, dying for crimes you committed, feeling the pain and torture of being crucified, and you are still refusing to acknowledge your sin and repent before God. One criminal's heart was soft, and the other one was hard. And the truth is that even if we're not in prison or facing the consequences that a convicted criminal would, we have all sinned. We've all broken God's law. Jesus paid the penalty we deserve for our bad choices. When we come to him for forgiveness, the good news is we are made righteous, holy, and blameless in the sight of God. That is good news. A wise person will recognize their sin and their need to be washed clean by God's love and mercy. And the third conviction is this. Are you still with me? We have Jesus Christ as Lord. We have the conviction that I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. We would say that about ourselves. And the third one is this. A conviction that a, a belief a wise person would hold is submitting to God's authority is best. Submitting to God's authority is best. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You know, in our pride, we think we know what's best, don't we? We think we know what's best. We think we can run our lives better than God can. We like to be the ones in charge. That's why it can be a struggle for people to come to a place of submitting or yielding to God's authority. But a wise person will ask God to be Lord of their lives. They will submit to God's will and God's ways, trusting that God truly has their best intentions in mind, that God is for them, not against them. God is not a killjoy, you know, who wants to see you unhappy, but he is a good, loving parent who knows what's best for us. And he knows what's going to give us true hope and true joy and true freedom. 
Earlier this year, as a church, we journeyed through the Alpha course in our Connect groups. And in this course, we looked at the foundational beliefs of Christianity. And in the sixth sec- uh, session, um, they were looking at like the guidelines that are given in Scripture that God instructs his people to follow. Like, is God just this big meanie, right, who doesn't want people to have fun? Is the Bible just a boring old rule book that we have to follow? Uh, well, no. God gives us wisdom for how to live and guidelines for how to live because he wants what's best for us. And they give the example of boundaries or rules within sports. So they argue, like, imagine in sports, and I'm really no good at sports, by the way. That's, I could tell you more embarrassing stories about that, but I won't. I don't have time, but if maybe another sermon. Anyway, I'll find some illustration about a horrible sporting event that I participated in. Anyway, so they give, they argue basically if there's no boundaries or guidelines within sports that people submitted to or adhered to, it would be really hard for people to play, right? Like imagine this. Imagine trying to play basketball, but the other team just runs all over the court holding onto the ball and the ref never does anything. Imagine trying to play soccer, but the other team insists it's okay. Their team has five people in the net. That's fine. That can be a a rule. Imagine playing golf with a friend, but they refuse to putt and just drop the golf ball in the hole with their hands. Not saying that I haven't done that during mini putt. I may, I may have done that before in desperation after putting 18 times. In the Alpha episode, they say this though, listen to this. God has given us guidelines for how to live, not because he hates us or wants us to be miserable, but because he loves us. And he wants us to enjoy life to the full. True freedom actually comes when we know that God is in control and that there are boundaries. Boundaries are given out of love. God didn't say you shall not murder because he wanted to ruin our fun. He didn't say don't commit adultery because he's a spoiled sport. He doesn't want people to get hurt. He loves you. He loves you. And the world's wisdom would be be your own boss, make your own choices, do what feels good, submit to authority. Who wants to do that? God's wisdom would say, God would say, trust me, follow me. Let me show you how to live a life of purpose and true freedom. True freedom is found in Christ, not in casting off restraint and doing whatever you want to do, right? That's what the prodigal son tried, and he found he was really empty on the inside. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he talks about two kinds of people, people who build their lives on him and submit to him, and people who do not. Matthew 7, 24 to 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Think about the contrast. A wise person hears God's word, obeys God's word, builds their life on Jesus, the rock, the firm foundation, and the outcome is they have a life that can withstand trials and difficulties. A foolish person? Well, they also hear God's word. In the story, Jesus says they hear God's word, but they don't heed God's instruction. They build their life on the sand, on unreliable, soft foundation. And the outcome is they have a life that cannot hold up under the pressures of this world. And what's a soft foundation? It could be personal accomplishment. It could be fame and fortune, temporary pleasures, self-fulfillment. But nothing and no one is a firm foundation like Jesus In scripture, he's referred to as the rock eternal. Isaiah 26, 4 says, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. Listen to this. Later in Isaiah 33, 6, it says, he will be a sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Did you catch that? Did you see it? What's the key to the treasure? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Wisdom begins when we have a reverence and respect for God. I want to invite the the team to come back up with me as we close. You know, one of the things that I love about God is that he actually delights in giving us wisdom. He's not this God who's like, well, I'm all wise and I'm just going to hoard all the wisdom for myself and you humans got to figure it out. Like he actually loves to give us wisdom. It says in James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, 
You should ask God who gives generously. He gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But in order to turn to God for wisdom and call out to him, we need to humble ourselves and revere him. Because we do live in an age where people can look at the Bible and say, well, that's super old, right? Like the Bible's antiquated. Like we're, we're much more enlightened now. Like it's 2023. We have so much more knowledge. We're way more enlightened than the people at the time when they wrote the Bible. But God's word is eternal. His truth is eternal. His word is just as relevant today and just as truthful today as when it was written. And it will always be that way. God's word will never fail. It's eternal. And all through the Bible, we can see stories of people whose hearts were soft towards God and people whose hearts were hard towards God. The same unconditional love and generous wisdom is available to all people, but some never choose, never choose to accept it. And so we all, we all have a choice to make, right? We can choose to go out our lives rejecting God. God's given us that freedom. Like he's not going to force you to follow him. He's not going to force you to obey him, right? He's given us freedom, free will to make that decision, right? But when we choose to come to God, recognizing that on the other side of our, division, our decision to follow him is a storehouse of incredible treasure, a loving, meaningful relationship with God, beautiful promises from God, like the promise of heaven, abundant wisdom for life. So my question to you tonight is this, have you started on the path of wisdom? Have you started on the path of wisdom? Would you stand with me tonight? Because I wanna give everybody an opportunity, if you haven't made that choice, if you haven't made that choice, that tonight would be the night where you say, yeah, I wanna make the choice to walk on a path of wisdom. I've been doing it my own way. These convictions that you're talking about tonight, they're actually not convictions yet in my heart, but I want them to be. I wanna walk on that, that path of wisdom. Well, the awesome thing is he extends that opportunity to each person. Every single person has an opportunity to say, God, I wanna be in relationship with you. God, forgive me. God, I wanna submit to your authority. You know what I think is amazing? Is that God actually makes it so simple. I want, I want you to think about this. I mean, God is God. God can do whatever he wants to do. He's in charge, right? He calls the shots. He can do whatever. He could have given us a 500-step program to get to salvation. I mean, if he wanted to. That would be crazy. But imagine if he did. Imagine if he said, well, if you do this and this and this and this and follow this and do this perfectly, then salvation. That's not our God. All you have to do is ask and receive. It's that simple. It is that simple. So don't complicate it in this room. God just wants you to come and to be with him. And if your heart is in that place where you're like, yeah, you know what? I want wisdom. I want God's wisdom. I want to do this life God's way. Then right now in this moment, you have that opportunity to come to him. And all it is, is, as a church, when we have these moments at the end of the service where we give people an opportunity, what we do is we just pray together. And it's just a prayer inviting Jesus into your heart and saying, Jesus, I want you to be Lord. Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Saying, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness. And God, I'm going to submit to your ways. Right? The overflow of a heart that's chosen to humble and be submitted to God and to fear the Lord. To say, God, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to bow down in reverence before you because I know you're all powerful and you're mighty and you're the one who's truly in charge. And I want to submit to your ways. And so with every head bowed and, and every eye closed in this room, we're going to pray a prayer together. And again, if, if that's you and you feel comfortable, one of the things we ask people to just raise their hand. You don't have to, but you can. And it's just when you raise your hand, you're just kind of putting up your hand to God saying, hey, me. I want this. You're extending your hand. You're making your hand open to him and saying, yeah, I want to live in relationship with you, God. I've tried to do it my own way. I've been living by a lot of worldly wisdom, but I'm going to humble my heart right now. I'm going to reach out my hand to you and say, God, I want to trust you. I want to trust you. I want to trust your wisdom. And so as a church family, we're going to repeat this prayer together. You can pray it with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your amazing love. I turn away from my sin and I ask for your forgiveness. 
Come into my life and give me a fresh start. I trust you and submit to you as my Lord and Savior. I'm now a Christian, a child of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. Help me live my life for you from this day forward. Amen.